Hi, this is Driti Shetty from UW Madison, and I'm going to be presenting our paper on a general I1 element derived from quasi static force displacement data. Now we know that bolts are a significant source of damping and frequency change in built up structures. At low amplitudes, the region that is closer to the bolt remains stuck due to the bolt preload being applied, while the regions that are further away from the bolt have a tendency to slip. This is known as microslip. In the microslip region, there is a small change in the frequency with an increase in the vibration amplitude, while there is a large increase in the damping ratio as the vibration amplitude increases. Now, as the vibration amplitude goes on increasing, we reach a point of macroslip where there is complete slip between the two surfaces. And there we observe a drastic decrease in the natural frequency and a change in the damping behavior. Now joints are typically designed to remain in microslip. And in cases where the modes remain uncoupled, instead of modeling each joint in a complex structure like this, we can model each nonlinear mode of that structure using a modal modeling approach. That is the nonlinear mode is modeled as a single degree of freedom system consisting of a linear spring, a linear damping, and a hysteretic element. Now, there are many different hysteretic models that exist, but the I1 model has been found to be the most suitable in capturing bolt joint dynamics. The I1 model consists of a parallel system of Jenkins elements, which is a Coulomb friction damper that is connected in series with a linear elastic spring. A distribution function is defined to measure the density of the sliders that have strength phi. In a parametric model, the distribution function rho of phi is typically a function of those parameters. For example, if you look at the four parameter I1 model, one that is commonly used in bolted joints dynamics, rho of phi is defined in terms of the four parameters r, chi, phi max, and s, resulting in a distribution function with power law behavior. Now we can obtain a relationship between the distribution function and the restoring force. If we consider the equation of motion of the nonlinear mode that we're interested in with the nonlinear restoring force written as a sum of the force due to the sliders that have slipped and those that are still stuck, and then take two derivatives of this nonlinear restoring force, what we can and then evaluate that those derivatives at q is equal to phi. Ultimately, what we can get is the distribution function in terms of the nonlinear restoring force. This means that if we know what the restoring force is, then we should be able to derive the distribution function from it. Now, how do we calculate what this restoring force is? For that, we can use quasi static modal analysis or QSMA, in which whatever mode we are interested in evaluating, we apply a static load to the structure in the shape of that mode. And then the corresponding deflection with the nonlinearities present is calculated from the finite element model. Now this is done over the amplitude range of interest to ultimately give us the restoring force backbone curve as seen in the orange, cu orange curve over here. Now the paper cited here also states how you can then use Mason's rules to find the total hysteresis loop to find the dissipation and to find the natural frequency. At this point, we're only going to be interested in the backbone curve though. Now our proposal is that you can fit a non-parametric modal I1 model to the backbone curve that is obtained from QSMA. Now, how would this be beneficial? Firstly, quasi-static analysis is computationally inexpensive, even for large finite element models. Secondly, the resulting I1 model should be providing more flexibility compared to any parametric model. And thirdly, when simulating the dynamic behavior, the in integrating the ODEs of the uncoupled nonlinear modes should be faster than integrating the whole finite element model. Next, we're going to look at the implementation procedure for obtaining this distribution function from the backbone curve. The first step is to get KT and K-infinity. KT is the low amplitude tangential stiffness and K-infinity is the linear macro slip stiffness. Both of these can be obtained using finite difference. 
Once we get these values, we can subtract out k infinity times q from the total restoring force to get the nonlinear restoring force, which can then be used to estimate phi max, which is the displacement at which macro slip occurs. This is equal to the displacement at which the slope of the curve goes to zero, as you can see. Next, we will subtract out kt times q to get what can be understood as the purely nonlinear component of the restoring force so that we can prevent any linear force from dominating the fit. Then once we get this raw data, we can apply a piecewise fit of splines of varying order. And the maximum order is determined by trial and error based on how much deviation you observe from the raw data. Once we get the piecewise spline fit, we can use the coefficients of the splines to determine the derivative values thus giving us some form of distribution function. Now, ultimately, we want to be using this distribution function to simulate the bolted joint dynamics. To do that, we need to discretize the region from zero to phi max. The method of discretization has been elaborated upon in the paper, but just going over the two factors that need to be considered, one is the number of discretization points typically varying between 30 to 100 based on the application. And second is alpha, which determines the density of the points from zero to phi max. So a value of alpha greater than one would mean there are more number of points closer to zero at low amplitudes, while a value less than one would imply higher density closer to phi max. Now the last step is to calculate the Dirac delta stiffness. We want to truncate the distribution function at macro slip using a Dirac delta function. And the coefficient of this Dirac delta can be understood as the Dirac delta stiffness, which must be chosen such that the total stiffness is equal to the tangential stiffness kt. Now we're going to be looking at a case study of a 2D finite element model of a cantilever beam assembly. This assembly consists of two beams that are bolted at one end and cantilevered on the other end. And this friction contact between the two beams modeled with mu equals 0.6. We are going to be analyzing the first bending mode of the beam, which has a frequency of about 198 hertz. Now this case is interesting for two reasons. Firstly, the evolution of contact cannot be easily captured by existing parametric models. And secondly, analyzing the full finite element model is very time consuming, thus warranting the need for a new approach. Now we looked at the evolution of contact by plotting the contact status in abacus for different points along the restoring force curve. So first at zero displacement, everything, the entire contact patch is stuck as we would expect. Note here that this side is the fixed end and the other side is the free end. Now, as we go to higher amplitudes, we can start to see the contact patch on the side of the fixed end starting to slip. And as we keep going ahead, we can see more of that happening. And then as you go to amplitudes beyond a certain point, we start to see the right hand side also starting to slip, which is accelerating the slip that is occurring. So the rate of slip has actually started to increase at this point until we reach the initiation of macro slip. Now this is interesting because the four parameter model or any I1 model existing, to my knowledge at least, would not be able to model this kind of behavior. So we're going to see if this non-parametric I1 model is able to. Now the backbone curve from QSMA was obtained in two parts, one from 0 to 0 0.127 mm to capture the low amplitude nonlinearity, and another from 0 to 0.698 mm to make sure that we get the macro slip point. And this was done in two parts to ensure that we have sufficient points to completely characterize the nonlinearity from 0 up until macro slip. For the low amplitude curve, we use third order splines, third order splines 
50 discretization points and alpha equals 1.2. And for the higher, higher amplitude curves, we use fourth order splines, 50 discretization points, but this time an alpha value equals 0.9. Now the distribution function that was obtained had a u-shaped curve and this explains why we used a value of alpha less than one for higher displacements that was to make sure that we are able to capture this rapid change in the distribution function now an interesting observation is that the displacement at which we had started to observe the right hand side slipping there is an increase in the rate at which slip was occurring at the contact patch when we were analyzing the abacus contact status. That displacement corresponds to the displacement at which the distribution function increases, giving us some confidence in the distribution function that was obtained. Now, there isn't a characterized I1 model that exists which has such a distribution function. It must be noted here that Siegelman proposed adding a fifth parameter to the four parameter I1 model that would be able to model some precisely this. But uh, as mentioned in Brake's paper on the rip joint and in the recent review paper on bolt joints, that model has not been experimentally verified or characterized yet, to the best of my knowledge again. Okay, so how well can this model estimate the dynamic behavior? To test that, we analyze the free response to an initial displacement condition. For the finite element model, we're applying a force in the shape of the force mode, releasing the force and computing the free response using implicit dynamic integration with a variable step size. The same initial condition was replicated for the non-parametric model I1 model and Newmark beta integration method was used. The dynamic response in the time domain when compared shows very good agreement in phase, but a slight deviation in the amplitude, as we can see over here. Now to further analyze this, we extract the instantaneous damping and frequency. And we observed that the finite element model actually deviates from both the non-parametric I1 model as well as the QSMA results for the damping. And this is due to some amount of numerical damping that's present within the finite element model itself. After correcting for this, we can observe that the damping matches almost perfectly. And the frequency is also in good alignment, thus proving that the suggested non-parametric I1 model turned out to be pretty effective. Now the Non-parametric model is orders of magnitude faster than integrating the full finite element model. For example, to simulate 0.5 seconds of the response, while the full model would take about 40 hours, using the modal I1 model approach with the non-parametric model, we can get the result in about three seconds. Also for running QSMA to obtain the distribution function, we need about 380 seconds in total which is still faster than implementing some sort of complex optimization algorithm to estimate a set of parameters. In conclusion, the proposed non-parametric I1 model directly extracts the distribution function from the backbone curve, thus providing us with more flexibility. And since we're using quasi-static analysis to obtain the curve that is computationally inexpensive even for large finite element models, we don't need any optimization algorithms to get some finite set of parameters. And it was found for the case study shown here that the dynamic behavior of the system can be accurately simulated from the non-parametric model. And that simulation time is much less than integrating the whole finite element model. Future work would involve extending the method to experimental applications. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And I hope you stay safe and I look forward to seeing you at the conference. Bye now.